Hey guys, I'm Chef Thomas with uh, Timo Foods Artisan Chocolates. And I'm here today at the Atlanta Botanical Gardens with their chocolate covered weekend. Uh, they asked me to come by and show you guys how to make some chocolate ice cream. So that's what we're gonna be focusing on today. Uh, real quick, in regards to the chocolate that I'm using, this is a brand called Coco Berry. And the type of chocolate that I'm using is a Coubertier chocolate, which is a very, very high quality chocolate. And it's really what we need to use to make this ice cream. Um, Hershey's Chocolate Chips is not gonna cut it. And the reason for that is because of the ingredients that are used to make these chocolates. So like I was saying, this is very high quality, um, you know, chocolate chips that are used for baking cookies is very low quality. It's a lot of sugar. Sometimes they put shortening or other kind of fats in there. Richard chocolate is always cocoa butter. It's gonna have cocoa liqueur, lecithin, sugar, and vanilla, and that's it. And that's what we wanna use. I'm also using what you see is a, a 65% cocoa berry and the percentage on these bags or on the bars of chocolates is gonna to refer to the amount of cocoa liqueur and cocoa butter that's in the actual chocolate. So the higher the number, that means the more chocolatey flavor and also the less sugar. So you have to keep that in mind. So if you're thinking, oh, I got 100%, it's gonna be the best one. Not necessarily. It could be quite bitter by the time you're all set it up. Um, so real quick about actual chocolate itself. You know, like how is it made? Where does it come from? It comes from cocoa beans, okay? And so there's a cacao tree. And you'll notice there's a difference in the pronunciation of cacao and cocoa. It changes, all right? So at first we have cacao tree, right? And on the cacao tree grows what we see right here, which are called cacao pods. On the inside of those pods are called cacao beans, which are these little things right here. They take those beans, they ferment them, and then they roast them. And at that stage, they then are called cocoa beans. Once they crack them open, inside are what are called cocoa nibs. That's what you're looking at right here in this little bowl. These cocoa nibs are then ground down into a fine, fine paste or a liquid, which they call cocoa liqueur. Then they take that cocoa liqueur and they put it in a huge machine that presses it and it separates the solids from the fats. And the fats are the cocoa butter, which you see in this container right here. It's called micrio. It's like a powdered cocoa butter. Um, and then the leftover byproduct from that process is called cocoa powder, which you have left over. So they take some cocoa liqueur that they didn't press. They take cocoa butter, from the cocoa liqueur that they did press, they mix that with sugar, vanilla, and lecithin, and now you have Coubertier chocolate. That's how we make this. So I just wanted to clarify that um, because I think it's important to understand the differences of, like, like I was saying, like the chocolate chips that you'd use to make cookies with versus chocolate that you'd use to make mousses, ice creams, chocolate show pieces, truffles. It's very different. So you know you're probably not going to get cocoa berry meringue, I would imagine, if you're going to make this at home but you could definitely go to the grocery store and find out a Coubertier chocolate. Just look for a bar that has a percentage on it. If it has a percentage on it, it's a Coubertier chocolate. So like Lindt is a good company that I like, L-I-N-D-T is a Swiss company. Um, I'm sure they have that at the grocery store somewhere. Um, if you're buying it in bars, you definitely want to break it up into smaller pieces. I'm gonna be using little pieces that come out of this bag. It's gonna be ideal when you go to mix the whole thing in the end, have smaller pieces, not giant chunks of chocolate, okay? So that's something to keep in mind. All right, so why don't we go ahead and get started in making the actual ice cream. This recipe is gonna be coming out of this book. This is the Culinary Institute of America's Baking a Pastry Book, second edition, and it came out of page 477 for their chocolate ice cream. I'm pretty much following it to a T. I did make one slight modification here, which is I'm gonna be using vanilla extract instead of vanilla beans. So I brought some extract here, as opposed to our vanilla beans over here. And the reason for that is because the beans are extremely expensive, especially right now. And so for me, making chocolate ice cream, I feel the flavor of the chocolate masks the vanilla a bit. And so I would rather use an extract as opposed to a vanilla bean, just because I feel like it's really not cost effective to use that for chocolate ice cream. If I was making just uh, vanilla ice cream, yes, I would use the beans. It would, it would definitely be preferred. And what we're going to do with our chocolate ice cream today is we're going to make a float. And so we're not doing a root beer float. A root beer float would be root beer with vanilla ice cream. We're going to do a cream soda float with chocolate ice cream. It's going to be good. All right, ready to get started? Start making it. I have pre-measured some ingredients already. This is seven ounces of sugar in this bowl. And then I also have the egg yolks. All set and ready to go. This is 10 ounces of egg yolks. And it took about 14 eggs to get 10 ounces of egg yolks. If you only have 12 eggs at home, it's fine. It's not the end of the world. Just use the 12 that you have. You don't need to now go to the store to get two more eggs. It's gonna work out this one. 
All right, so part one, I'm gonna put these 10 ounces of yolks into this bowl here. And I'm also going to actually get the liquids ready. I'm gonna be using heavy cream and whole milk. And you see, I do buy organic. I tend to go the organic route for most products, not everything, but most of them, dairy being one of them. And then also one thing to note is I'm going to be using a digital scale to measure everything. So what's good about digital scales is that they're pretty dead on and accurate. Um, think about using like, you know, volume measurements such as cups. For what we're doing today, it would be fine. But ideally, you'd want to use a digital scale because it is dead on accurate. You know, the way one person measures a cup versus how someone else measures a cup, it may not be exactly right. So I usually use a digital scale. And so I'm going to turn it on and zero it out. Make sure that there's, it's on zero when you go to measure everything. It's being funny today. I need exactly 16 ounces of cream. So I'm just going to pour this into the pot. I don't need to measure this one. All right, so we got 16 ounces of cream. Just gonna go in here. And then I'm also gonna need 16 ounces of milk. Could shake this up before you pour it in here. So you see there's some fat that has settled, but I'm gonna stir it all together anyway, so it's gonna get mixed up. Right. Set with that. And then we need 16 ounces of milk. We're using whole milk. This is where I need my scale. So I'm going to pour it on here. We'll go to 16. Hopefully I can read it upside down. So close. Even if it's a little bit over, it's not going to be the end of the world. There we go, 16. There are certain things in pastry where if you mismeasure, it's really bad, such as baking soda and baking powder. But for making ice cream, you know, 16 ounces of milk versus 16.5 ounces of milk, not a big deal. Not going to be a problem. Okay, so we got that done. Come back to our eggs here. Now, one thing to notice is that, yeah, we're making this ice cream with eggs, which makes it a French ice cream, uh, French style ice cream. You've probably seen in the grocery store, it says French vanilla ice cream, and that has nothing to do with the vanilla. It has everything to do with how the ice cream is made and the ingredients in the actual ice cream. So like an American style ice cream is gonna be mostly cream, uh, milk, sugar, and some kind of flavorings, vanilla if you're doing vanilla. Uh, French style ice cream has egg yolks, so that's, that's the big difference here. And we're going to have to cook it to make what's called creme anglaise, which is English cream, which we, in baking and pastry, would use as a sauce on plated desserts. But if you take that exact same sauce and you put it in an ice cream machine, now you have French-style ice cream. Magic. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to make a French-style chocolate ice cream. It's going to be good. All right, so I have seven ounces of sugar here. I'm going to take half that sugar and add it to my milk and cream. And the other half is going to go directly into my eggs. You don't want that to sit like this too long by itself. You want to start whisking that pretty immediate because sugar is what we call hygroscopic, which means it absorbs moisture and it also lowers freezing temperatures and raises boiling temperatures. But because it absorbs moisture, if you just let it sit on the eggs for a long period of time without stirring it or anything, it's going to start cooking the eggs. Now that sounds kind of weird because there's no heat being applied, or applied, but if you think about like cured meats, right? They take those raw meats, they cover them in sugar and salt, and that pulls out the moisture of the meat, thus cooking it. There's no actual heat applied. So the same thing can happen to these eggs, right? So the reason we didn't put all the sugar in the eggs is because that can be a lot of sugar and it can start kind of cooking the eggs a bit here. In addition to that, by adding it to the, the liquids here, it's gonna make these liquids a little bit hotter than boiling. So boiling is gonna be 212 degrees Fahrenheit. Once you start adding sugars and salts to it, it changes that temperature. So boiling, for the amount that I've added, it's probably not going to be too much different, maybe like 213. But the more sugar you add or the more salt you add to your liquids, it means it requires a colder temperature to freeze it or a hotter temperature to boil it. And the way that I remember it is to think about like the Antarctic Ocean. It's super, super cold, but the water's still liquid. How's that possible? It's because it's salt water. 
a lot of salt in there. All right. All right, so we've got our sugar in here, we've got our milk, we've got our cream, we've got our eggs, a little bit of sugar there. I'm gonna take some vanilla. You know, I'm not using the beans, I'm gonna use the extract instead. Let's go, let's just do like a teaspoon. It's a decent amount. Well, probably more than a teaspoon. Not a big deal. It's not just gonna ruin it. All right, and then we also need a quarter teaspoon of salt. So I got some granulated salt here. So I'll take a quarter teaspoon of salt. This is, I find salt is the missing ingredient a lot of times in people's desserts. That's all it needed, which is like a little bit of salt to set it off. Because we love salty and sweet. A lot of people don't realize it, but we do. All right, so we got salt in here, we got sugar in here. We're gonna bring this to a boil. And then what I'm gonna to have to do is what's called temper. I'm gonna to have to temper in this hot liquid into my yolks and sugar that we have over here. You can't just pour it all on top. You could possibly cook the eggs. What's also interesting to note about the sugar being in the eggs is it does actually help prevent the heat of this from overcooking it as you're pouring it in. It's kind of weird. So itself could cook it, but then it also acts as sort of insurance. So I'm just trying to stir this, stir this fat that's in here, I'm trying to mix it up a little more since I did not shake up that container. And it's dissolving, it's not a big deal. You can see the heat starting to come off here. We do want to bring it to a boil. And the reason for that is because the colder this is, we're gonna eventually have to put all this back into this pot. So the colder this is, the longer it takes to then cook it once you have it all in here. So definitely bring it to a boil. And another thing you can do is just take this, take a towel, just water out it. You can make a little holder for the ball so it doesn't spin around as you're trying to temper all these liquids in. See? Something like that, keeps it in place. So then when you're tempering in, so the bowl's not like stirring around everywhere. You're getting there. Now, of course, if you wanted to take this up a notch, you could infuse this cream and milk with different spices. So if you wanted to do like a cinnamon chocolate ice cream, throw some cinnamon sticks in there. Maybe a little bit of star anise, some cardamom. Now we're starting to go for like a chai flavoring at that point. But that's absolutely doable. Um, ginger, if you want to do like a ginger chocolate, throw some ginger root. You could do lemongrass, if you want to start getting some Southeast Asian flavors in there. The sky's the limit, really. Now, of course, you would strain it all out before you go to spin the ice cream. We're almost there. Get the ladle, strainer, get that ready. Oh yeah, it's coming to a boil. Just wanna let it go a little bit longer. So this is something you wouldn't want to mix like the day before and then pop in the fridge and be like, oh yeah, tomorrow, that step's already ready. I'll just pop it out and finish it off. Now, because the amount of time that sugar is going to sit with these eggs overnight, it's probably going to start cooking them. All right, I don't know if you guys can see that, but it is coming to a rolling boil now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to lower this heat. Maybe I might even just turn it off. And this is where we need to start adding this to this gradually. Creme on lace. Made lots of this in the past in hotels and restaurants. 
This stage, I'm just going to use the towel to pick up the rest. There we go. Very nice. All right, and then all this goes right back into here. And then from here, we're going to switch from using a whisk to using a rubber spatula. I'm going to turn the heat back on. I'm going to keep it at kind of a medium heat, medium high-ish. With this being an induction burner, I hope I'm accurate with the numbers here. And the way we're going to know that this is done, because now we have to cook this to approximately 180, 185 degrees Fahrenheit, or until it comes to the back of the spoon, basically. But I don't know if you can see all this like foam that's on the top, that should be gone. Once all that foam is gone, you're gonna be very close to being done. Uh, if you go too long, you're going to cook it and you're gonna have very sweet omelet floating around in here, basically. And that's not good, we don't want that. So once I'm done actually cooking this, I'm then gonna pour it out into a new bowl because if you leave it in the pot, it's gonna keep cooking. Even if you turn the heat off, even if you move the pot over to the, the counter, doesn't matter. The pot is still extremely hot and we're dealing with eggs in here. So they're, they're gonna cook. So it's really important that you take it out of the pot as soon as it's ready. And if you notice, I'm going the same direction. And what I do is I kind of do spiral motions, like from kind of the outside area of the walls towards the center of the pot and then kind of back out again. You want a really nice, even, flow so that we don't end up with a spot where nothing is being moved and then you have like omelet forming on the bottom of the pot. So yeah, that foam is going away. We are almost there. You could use a thermometer. I find more people just mess it up with a thermometer because they're waiting for numbers instead of paying attention to stirring this. Really just look for it, I think. Oh yeah, look at that. That is way thicker. And that foam is pretty much gone. We are good to go here. All right, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to pour this out to this new bowl. All right, that's going to stop it from cooking. Okay. Back over here. So we are all set with heat. Now, I need to measure my chocolate. So we're gonna measure chocolate, I believe it's six ounces. What did I do with the rest of those balls? So when you see this chocolate come out, you see it's not in bar shape. Don't worry, I washed my hands 180 times today. There we go. I've got six ounces of chocolate. Okay, and then I want to switch which one is in which. All right, so from here, we need to strain this creme anglaise gradually into our chocolate. So I'm going to pour about a ladle's worth. You can see all the stuff that is left behind in the strainer. It's a little bit of cooked egg, which we don't want to have a whole lot of. So we want to get that out. In addition to that, you know, the eggs, they have a, a thing called a chalice, which connects the yolk to the, or it basically suspends the yolk in the middle of the egg, right? And those little threads that connect it are always left in here. So it's part of what we're straining out. Okay, so I did one ladle so far, that's it. And we're just, we let that sit for a second, and that heat is gonna really melt this chocolate. If you start immediately stirring it, you may find that you have a lot of chunks left over. Okay, so we're gonna start incorporating. And like I said, just start with one ladle. You don't wanna do too much. Second ladle. 
again, incorporate this in before you start adding more. Because again, you don't want to have like giant chunks of chocolate floating around here. That's why it's important that you do it gradually. Nice and smooth. I would say if you were, if you try to do this with like chocolate chips or something, this would just be probably a pasty mess at this point. All right, let's do another one. As this gets closer in consistency to this, you can start adding more than just one at a time. But in the beginning, this is how you want to do it. If you want to have a nice, you know, smooth, consistent product. Say probably after this one, I can go ahead and pour the rest in here. Because again, that's what we're looking for is the consistency to be closer to that consistency than it was to the original consistency. So as long as the two are pretty similar, then you can add more. And it should be fine. Also, something to note about the size pot that I was using, you definitely need it to be big enough to where you can stir things comfortably. So I might, it might have looked like overkill to use a pot that size. Yeah, it probably could have gone like slightly smaller, but like I said, you really want to make sure you have enough room that you can actually stir things. Because if you use a pot that is exactly the size for all the liquid you have, good luck not making a mess. All right, should be all set there. And then from here, this is going to go into what we call an ice bath. And some people have asked me, do I need to put water in an ice bath? Can I just do a bowl of ice? Yes, you need water in the ice bath. That's why it's called a bath. You can't take a bath without water. In addition to that, this is just a bowl of ice. It's not going to work, work as effective as an ice bath would because water is what's going to completely encompass the bottom of this bowl, and that's how it's going to evenly cool everything down. So if you just have a bowl of ice, that's not an ice bath. That's just a bowl of ice. Okay, so from here, here we go. Set that inside, and then we cool it down, basically. Once it is completely cool, and ideally you let it set up in the fridge for at least a few hours, that's when you would put it in the ice cream machine to churn it. As you can see, it's very hot right now. You definitely want to, don't want to put a hot liquid inside an ice cream machine as a freezing unit. You could potentially really mess up that ice cream machine. And obviously, this would take a while to cool down. Like I said, just a few hours. You're not going to sit here and watch me cool this for a few hours. Um, but I've already done a batch. TV magic, right? So I'm going to show you consistencies, the, dif the difference consistency between one that's already cooled and then the fresh one. All right, so let's see, much thicker, right? And that's because I you know I'm using actual chocolate in here. So one thing to note about, you know, the different chocolate ice creams that you can buy in the stores, a lot of them don't even have chocolate in it. They have chocolate flavoring in it. 
And so they just color it to look at like look like chocolate. What you'll find is that when you make ice cream with actual chocolate, it's going to be a little more firm than you're used to, most likely, uh, because of the actual chocolate. Like I said, if you're just using artificial flavorings, you can get a really, really, really soft chocolate uh, chocolate ice cream. But again, too, the amount of sugar that's in the ice cream is also going to determine how solid it is. So if you have a lot of sugar in your ice cream, it's going to be very soft. Uh, and then, yeah, because of TV magic, I've already got ice cream spawned and ready to go. Something else to note here is that I pressed plastic wrap against the top of it. And that's something you actually want to do. So when you buy ice cream, a lot of times you'll find it has like a plastic film over the top. That's not for fun. That's to prevent ice crystals from forming, or as we know, freezer burn, right? So most of us will peel that off and then throw that away and never think about it again. But actually, if you throw it away, just use plastic wrap and then press that against the top of the ice cream before you put it back in the freezer. And you should not have any kind of freezer burn or ice crystals forming at all, right? And what we're gonna do, like I said, we're gonna make a float. Glass here, a spoon. Take this off. Some ice cream scoop because that's what it's for. How much for a float? Two, three? I don't think you can have too much, right? Three. All right. Then we need our cream soda. It's definitely going to foam up a lot. Oh yeah, there we go. Got ourselves a chocolate ice cream float. I think that about does it. Thanks for watching, guys. <laughs>